Um, so my name is Ryan Jackwood. I'm the science director for the Harpeth Conservancy. This is kind of one of our outreach events that we do on a monthly basis um, and just kind of more of an educational. We pick a topic and then bring in experts to talk about um, things that we find interesting in nature and our waterways that um, are relevant to our organization. And so what we do, um, our vision is clean water and healthy ecosystems for rivers championed by people who live here. Um, and we kind of work in four main areas. Um, and kind of funnily enough, we're doing some of our annual planning. And so these are, you know, morphing a little bit, but these are kind of really consistent um, where we work. We work in our clean water protection program, which is a lot of the policy work that we do as an organization. Um, so looking at permits, looking at different laws um, and how they may affect river health. We also have a river science, wildlife monitoring and restoration program. Um, it does a lot of science research. Um, we'll do some restoration events. We just had one on Sunday that was removing invasive species from the Gossett Track area out in the Narrows. Um, we have a rural protection and land use program that's um, a lot about trying to influence development and growth of the area and in a kind of a smart and sustainable way to protect our um, ecosystems. And then we've got community engagement and leadership building, which is kind of trying to foster the next generation of of environmentalists and sustainability um, kind of goal-oriented people. And so um, that's also kind of one of the areas that we that we think are, you know, is really important for the future really of um, kind of our local ecosystems. Um, our next, um, so we've got one of our other programs is called Lessons on the River and they're hands-on and in-person programs. Um, we've got one coming up in February, and it's a walk on the Richland Creek Greenway, and we're going to get some people that are going to be able to talk about, you know, some of the really interesting ecosystem um, areas along Richland Creek, maybe some of the issues that we have down there, but also some of the really, the beauty that, that is Richland Creek, and so we're really excited about this. Um, our upcoming Conservation Conversations, which is this program here that we're doing tonight, um, we've got obviously the one tonight. And then we've got two more scheduled for in February and March. And February is gonna be Your Voice Matters for Clean Water. And so we're gonna be looking at some state and national rules around policy um, that our COO, Jim Redwine, um, who's a lawyer is gonna kind of lead that effort and kind of pick some cool issues that are upcoming um, and might be of concern to us. And then in March, we're going to do a women in science or women in environmental science program. And so we're going to try to really find some some um, uh, some women that are experts in these areas and really try to empower them and, and give them kind of a platform to, to give us some good insight in what they're working on. Some other ways you can take action with our organization. We do have volunteer events. Um, uh, you know, like I mentioned, we had a restoration event. And so definitely kind of get on our website and look at, um, we've got an events tab that can kind of keep you posted on stuff that's coming up. Um, we've got an Amazon Smile and Kroger Community Rewards account. Um, and so if you get involved with those, we get a little bit of money, uh, you know, whenever you make a purchase on Amazon or at Kroger. Um, and then definitely check out all of our social media. We're on just about all of them. And, you know, if you, if you Google Harpeth River Facebook or, you know, go to our website, you can find all of those there. Um, we also have a license plate program. So if you see these license plates around town or on, on cars, those actually benefit us. And, and so they're, they're pretty easy to get. There's, there's a website. You can also find all this information on our website, on our um, website as well. So um, that's one that we're really proud of and, it, and it's, it's, it's growing. I'm, I'm starting to see them everywhere. Um, so that's really exciting as well. So tonight, our two speakers are Dory Bowles and Ron Taylor. Um, so Ron Taylor is the Clean Water Nashville's program director. He's going to provide us details on the city's massive $1 billion program to update sewer capacity and to reduce sewer overflows in order to reduce health risks from exposure to bacteria and contaminants, as well as improve water quality. And Dory Bowles, the CEO of Harpeth Conservancy, um, she's an is an expert and will highlight how common household behavior can help reduce the risk of sewer overflows how to identify and report a potential overflow of untreated sewage for quick, quick response and details about efforts by Franklin and Brentwood and other communities in the region to upgrade sewer infra infrastructure and inform the public in a timely fashion. 
And so with that, I'm going to toss it over to Ron and let him kind of wow us with all this really cool information that he's got. I got to peek at the presentation earlier. How is it? How is it? I just started really. Well, this is Ron Taylor. I'm with Metro Water and I manage a program we're going to talk a little bit about. And I am an engineer. I apologize for that. I try not to speak like an engineer, but if you get confused, tell me to speak in English. Feel free to jump in. So Nashville has an overflow problem and we admit it. And we've been fighting for a long time to deal with it. And in 2007, we were approached by four agencies, EPA, Department of Justice, TDEC, and Tennessee Attorney General. And they said, you've got a problem. We can fight it out in court or we can make an agreement. Well, we submit reports every month that show just how guilty we are. So the better course of action is to reach an agreement, which is called a consent decree. Consent decree is a legal action approved by a federal judge, and it makes a commitment that Nashville is going to spend a lot of money to address these problems. We're going to talk about some of these problems over a few minutes. We're going to talk a little bit about combined sewer overflows, a problem only unique to Nashville in Middle Tennessee, and more about sanitary sewer overflows. So those two programs combined into a capital program we call Clean Water Nashville that will represent about a one and a half billion dollar investment. And we're part of the way through that. We've got a few more years to work on it. So first, this term combined sewer, what does it mean? Fortunately, there are only three communities in Tennessee that have combined sewers, Nashville, Chattanooga, Clarksville. And only a very small portion of our collection system is combined. Combined sewers were implemented in the mid 1800s when it's finally realized that cholera outbreaks are killing millions of people across the globe were typically caused by water supply contaminated by sewage. So the plan was let's get sewage away from our water supplies. At the same time though, these highly populated areas had huge animal populations. And so you had tons of animal waste on the streets. Whenever you got large rainfall events, you had contaminated runoff also affecting water supplies. So the idea is let's build large pipes and convey both sewage and contaminated runoff to the rivers. And at that point, there's no such thing as treatment. So it's all going straight to the river. In fact, at the end, we can do a, a quiz as to who can guess when Nashville first had actual sewage treatment. The upper left image here shows our largest combined sewer nearly the point that it goes to the river. That sewer is 16 and a half feet in diameter and seven courses of brick thick. It's ginormous. So we still have combined sewers in downtown. Dry weather, we're great. Daylight today, we're good. But you get really intense rains and there's so much runoff that goes into those pipes that we can't convey it all to the treatment plant. So a portion can enter the river called a combined sewer overflow or CSO. Our area of combined sewers is fairly small. It's mostly downtown within the I-440 area, a little bit going into East Nashville. 1990, we had 32 individual overflow sites, some of which actually went into creeks like Browns Creek. We solved those problems. We're down to six sites at overflow, all straight to the Cumberland River. And as part of this consent decree, we've got plans to address those remaining sites. So combined sewers only for Nashville. Hey, Ron. Yeah. Um, can you go back on that map one sec? That th yeah. This is Dory. Am I correct that if like, if you're standing inside the yellow zone, then it gets collected and then where does it pop into the river? Like where's that end point where there's it a- It pops into the river at that big pipe that I showed, that okay. one that dates back to 1892. And it's like it's a little diamond that- yard the is. About a mile north of downtown. Okay. So everywhere else has separate sanitary sewers. So you got one pipe that carries sanitary sewage, one pipe that carries stormwater runoff. So our problems are solved, right? Well, not really, otherwise we wouldn't have this conversation. So there's two general reasons we have sanitary sewer overflows. 
One is there's way too much flow in that pipe. And that's not intentional flow, unlike combined sewers. It's flow that gets in through inadvertent leaks. The second is we can have blockages. Blockages can occur both in private lines or in public lines. So we're gonna talk about those two general types. So sewers don't age well, they have defects. And we find these defects by putting in these crawler cameras, this thing in the center that goes in the sewer, makes videotapes and allows us to see where these issues are. The defects look kind of like this. They tend to be worse in clay pipes and sewer and, and concrete pipes that we used before the mid 1970s. Since then we tend to use plastic pipes, which are much more resilient. So these defects can be cracks, they can be leaks at joints, they can be a leak at a point where a pipe section connects to a manhole or the manhole itself. Now in dry weather, these little cracks and stuff aren't too big of a deal. But in really heavy rainfall, a big soaking rainfall like we get in the wintertime, the groundwater table rises high enough to be over our pipes. Every one of these defects then becomes a potential leak like the one on the right. You get enough leaks and there's too much flow for us to be able to manage and that can lead to an overflow. Other types of defects, we can get roots in sanitary sewers. Trees are really effective at looking for sources of water. So the roots can be a blockage or when they get in, they can further separate that joint section which can allow more water to intrude during big wet weather events. Or then manholes. We put manholes in any time a sewer changes direction so we can get in and maintain the sewer. These older type manholes with bricks can be another source of leaks, so we have to look for those. So say you're Nashville, you got a big overflow problem, you're gonna address it. What is your solution set? Typically it's one of three things. First off, we can reduce the amount of flow that we have in that wet weather event talk about how to do that. Secondly, we may be able to temporarily store that excess flow during the big rainstorm so it doesn't escape into the environment. And after the rain subsides, we drain it back into our system and retreat it. Third, there may be certain areas we have to increase the capacity of our system. We hate to have to do that, but there may be certain areas that require it, often driven by growth. And goodness knows, Williamson County and South uh, Davidson County have had growth issues. So what do these solutions look like? <clears throat> if we've got a leaking pipe, multiple defects, it's old. We could dig up that pipe and replace it. But that's really invasive and it tears up streets and affects traffic. Well, there are newer ways to do that that can create a new pipe inside the old pipe and not dig up the road. It's called cured in place lining. And this graphic represents how we do it. We insert a flexible liner in a manhole that extends to the next manhole. That flexible liner is impregnated with the resin. The resin is activated by hot water. The hot water turns that flexible liner pipe into a hard plastic pipe that connects to the inside of the host pipe, like the lower left shows. So here's what it looks like in the field. On the left, we have probably an eight inch uh, CIPP pipe that's going in. On the right, a much larger one. So these are the flexible original pipes that have the resin impregnated in them. They're put in these manholes, stretched from manhole to manhole. Hot water is used to activate that resin, which turns that into a hard plastic pipe that adheres to the inside of the host pipe. So no more joint leaks, no more defects. So we're good to go, right? Almost. Now that we've got that liner in between manholes, there may be a connection to a house or a business. We've got to go inside then and reconnect that, open up that opening, and then reconnect that household connection to our sewer. And in Nashville's case, whenever we do that, we also put a new sewer line from our sewer to the customer's property line, it's shown here in the middle image, and we put a new clean out. Not all utilities do that. If we've got leaking manholes, we also rehabilitate those by using a sprayer liner to stop the leaks. 
The second type of fix we talked about was storage tanks. Here, either below ground and can drain by gravity or above ground, we pump into a tank in those huge storm events where we've got too much flow that we can manage. This tank is normally dry, but in wet weather events, we fill it up with diluted sewage. That way it can't escape and impact the streams. After the rain's over, we drain it back into our system for treatment. This particular tank is in a park in West Nashville. The third type of solution is capacity improvements. There may be areas where we still have to convey more than we want to, either from too much wet weather or from growth. So that can be a new gravity pipe, could be an upgrade or a new pumping station. So some of those defects we talk about with sanitary sewers can also happen on private sewers in your house or your business. We typically find those kind of defects by smoke testing. We'll take a smoke bomb, put it in a manhole, put a blower on top of that manhole, and then the smoke looks for the path of least resistance. And so the shot on the lower right, whenever we see smoke, that may be a defect in a private sewer. And typically most utilities require defects in the private property to be fixed by the property owner. So it's important that you maintain your system too. The most common defect we found the upper right corner are cleanout caps. Either the cap is missing or the cleanout may have been cut off at grade. Now if a cleanout is above grade like this one, it's not too big of a problem, but it's in a valley. And that valley collects a lot of rainwater in big storms. All that rainwater enters our system. So that's really a problem for us. So Dory and I talked about what's important for you to help us. You know, we've got a lot of monitoring in our collection system. Every pumping station we have has a monitor. Most of the frequent overflow points have monitors. So we know what happens then. But the more infrequent points that occur, we may not recognize ourselves. So that if you see those, it, you are, can be a great help to us if you let us know that you observed an overflow. Likely we know about it, but in case we don't, then we can add it to our list and create a solution to that. There's a number there and there's uh, a way to reach out to us. These presentations will be available, so don't write anything down. Dorian also talked about sewer odors because that's a, an awful subject that comes up. Now, if you're in downtown Nashville where we've got those combined sewers, you may periodically detect a mild sewer odor. That's unfortunate, but normal, because these catch basins connect straight to a pipe that's carrying sanitary sewage. If you're away from the combined system in Nashville or in the surrounding areas, when you detect sewer odors, it may or may not be normal. If you're near a pumping station, you may notice a slight sewer odor. That's not necessarily a problem. But if it's a strong odor, it may indicate that sewage has been stagnant for a longer period of time and that may mean an overflow. I've been out bike riding and found overflows just from the stink. So if you detect those strong odors, once again, let us know, it may be a problem. Now let's talk about a couple of consumer issues. So-called flushable wipes. This has become a $3 billion industry and there are wipes that are labeled as flushable and wipes that are labeled as non-flushable. The flushable wipe label and our view is incorrect. Nothing should ever go down a toilet except toilet paper. Why is that? This is an indication of what happens. This is three beakers with a mixer in the middle. The beaker on the left has toilet paper. It disperses pretty quickly. Beaker on the right has a paper towel. Now we wouldn't put a paper towel down a commode. Beaker in the middle, a splushable wipe. It's been there for quite a while. Flushable wipes don't separate in a sewer like toilet paper does. So they stay fairly intact. And then they can create clogs. They can clog your sewer. They can clog our sewer or our pumps. So our strong belief is only put toilet paper down the toilet. Never put a so-called flushable wipe down the toilet. Grease. Another problem, grease, and I'm sure everybody on this call doesn't put grease down the drain, but hot grease 
solidifies. When it solidifies, it can create a clog. Most large utilities like us have a fast oil and grease program. Now, our biggest culprits are restaurants because they put, create a lot of grease. Restaurants have to have commercial grease trap, they have to maintain that. So we do inspections to ensure that occurs. But grease also is, can be a problem in our residential customers. I think Dory may talk more about that in a few minutes too. So we got wipes, we got grease. You put them together, you can have a real problem. Some of you may have heard a few years ago about this term fatberg. Well, a fatberg occurred in London that was almost three footballs long. So they can be serious issues that can create large problems and be really expensive. So my program is Clean Water Nashville. If you want to know more information, cleanwaternashville.org. There's plenty of information there about the program. I was also allowed to do uh, a commercial. I am a board member for the Clean Water Professionals of Kentucky and Tennessee. We're a member association for the Water Environment Federation, a national group of water professionals consisting of like 50,000 people. Every year we have a conference that combines our clean water group and our drinking water group. It's called the Water Professionals Conference this year in Chattanooga in August. So if you wanna learn more about these organizations or attend our conference, feel free to follow up. And that's it for me. That's great, thank you so much. And Ron, like you mentioned, uh, we will be emailing this uh, out to everyone um, and we'll include this PowerPoint uh, to everyone so you can get all the information and your contact information. <laughs> can everybody hear me if I got everything working? You're good. Yeah, looks good. By the way, hello everybody. Oh. I thought it would be great if Ron went because he can show you showed you all the graphics about how things work underground. And so I thought I'd give you a little bit of like what it really looks like. I've got a couple of videos and I thought it'd be really valuable. To, there was a great channel seven Fox 17 story last year. Uh, so give you a sense of what these things are why, and why we pick this time of year when some of our sewer systems get overloaded. And then also importantly, what can we all do about it? And Ron's hit on a lot of it, so please feel free to jump in. I only have like four slides of you. I don't need to run consistently, but I thought you might enjoy seeing some of, of the pictures of sort of like real situations. And I, this is just one slide to give you a sense of, of our organization and our clean water program. We work on obviously different sources of water quality problems. And the obvious one everybody knows about is like sewer plants, right? Because that's what we created the Clean Water Act for too, for industrial sources, sewage treatment, now we're talking tonight about sewer plants, like they process your sewage and then they discharge it into a river somewhere. There are other ways of processing sewage. And one of the, a lot of, that goes on in Tennessee is um, septic fields and septic tanks that you have. Um, most people are not very familiar of how to manage their own septic tank. So what you heard Ron say about don't use the wipes, don't use the wipes. It doesn't matter whether you've got a big sewer system you're hooked up to or a, your own septic tank. Um, the other thing that we'll touch on at some point in a, in a different uh, presentation probably is about these alternative sewer systems that actually use ground as the final treatment. So it's almost like a, um, a centralized uh, septic tank and field for a neighborhood. And they have their own little um, own challenges and we're not gonna touch on those tonight. So we're gonna focus on, and so our organization in terms of focusing on sewer systems we are obviously working on how are the sewer plant permits designed by the state and the feds and what's in them so that if sewer plants are discharging into water bodies that don't meet the state water quality standards, and those standards are set to protect public health and to, uh, maintain water um, wildlife habitat, so forth, drinking water supply. We, are, we have a big focus on working on the overall uh, design of sewer permits so that all these water bodies meet the water quality standards. And on the left side here is a lot of work we've done with TDEC. I can see one of the big issues is how much nitrogen and phosphorus is now going into our waterways. Our sewer plants do a great job of removing E. coli and all that, but our bodies still produce nutrients because we're animals. So you'll see in the chart here that in working with Franklin, for example, and they're optimizing their sewer plant, didn't build a new one yet, they're in, in the middle of it 
but there's a program that TDEC invested in to really look at ways existing sewer systems of all sizes can optimize how they function to reduce the amount of phosphorus that goes into the waterways. So we can see that Franklin, even without the new sewer plant that they're building, reduced about 30% learning how, figuring out how their system could be run better, which is why the amount of rain going into sewer plants matters because it can dilute that system of bacteria that are digesting everything, which is why people like people like Ron and Nashville, Franklin and others are and Brentwood are building these big tanks to hold that rainwater that gets in the lines. We also, uh, back in 2014, we looked back at five years of how three of the sewer plants in the Harpeth, because they're really close together, servicing all the growth in Franklin, how they were uh, meeting all their criteria in their sewer permits. And we actually filed three um, citizen lawsuits. And the upshot of what's really cool about this effort was working with Franklin on how to create a more public, quick information from the sewer systems to the public. And I'll get into that in a minute, because I think it's very important that around the state that the people are more familiar with when, it's, when they're happening and how they can report it, and that way they can see what's going on and where the hot spots are in a sewer system. The other big reason then is also so that elected officials are more understanding of the need to maintain these systems. It's not cheap to keep your collection system going. And I hate to say it, but most people understand the problems of um, too many kids in school or traffic and, man, you know, uh, what I call uh, man, uh, what, um, potholes, right? But people really don't see the sewer infrastructure getting old. So it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So really the value of sewer overflows is to help put that on top of mind. So I'm going to switch over to, hold on a minute. Um, I'm gonna show you a three minute great spot that uh, Fox 17 did last year on sewer overflows. And it touches on Brentwood as a great example of what happens when you have an old line and has a lot of rain going in it. It doesn't mean Brentwood's special, it's just, it gives you a good sense of what that means. And they really struggle with that um, in their main old line during this time of year. And they are in the process of building one of those big tanks, if you will. So here's the map of where we're talking about. Um, here is Brentwood in I-65. Here's South going north. You see that, Mike? Did it all make sense to you guys? We're seeing your. Um, so we can't see anything, Dory. Oh, did, okay. Seeing, yeah, yeah. You've got to. You, yeah, you've got to share. You have your to go actual, back each time and share it again. Well, just share your window, Dory. Unless you've got. Oh, the I'll do, that's okay. I got it. I'll okay. figure it out. Thanks for just let me know. Okay, does that yeah. work? Yep, yeah, I see you, Matt. All right. So here is Brentwood, Old Hickory. Uh, Percy Warner Parks. So here's the little Harpeth. And Brentwood has done a tremendous amount of work doing the liners that, that Ron was talking about. But this is one of their main sewer lines and they used to have a sewer plant right there. And then it got re um, taken offline and they ran a line and connected to a pump station here. And then it goes up Chickering into Nashville. So all of, most all of Brentwood sewage is actually now processed by the city of Nashville. And if you want growth, you need to solve your sewer and drinking water problems. And so that's the big thing that's gone on in the last 25 years or some of these satellite cities connecting to bigger city systems. So I'm gonna show you this uh, uh, three minute uh, channel uh, Fox 17 news story. And they're focusing on the site right there, which is where right before it gets to the pump station, it's, there's so much rainwater getting in that it just comes out of the manhole. So now Ryan, I need to stop sharing and then do that again with my other where is, I just want to share the whole screen, like you said, right? Yeah, if you click the, you ought to be able to just click I found the, it. Aha! Uh -huh. I've only done this like 10 times and I still never get it quite right. There's my screen. <laughs> and here we go. Can you see Fox 17? Yep. Oh, sweet. I'm getting good at this. Okay. So now they're going to touch on Clarksville about combined sewer overflows, but they're really going to focus on Brentwood. So this will really help you get, get ready for some visuals. And I'm just going to keep it this size unless you want me to make it. I think that's probably fine, Dory. This historic growth and how it can be better managed. Now, tonight, we are focusing on a rather stinky topic, sewage overflows. It is a problem plaguing many cities, due in part to rapid development and aging infrastructure. What's being done to contain the problem in this week's Project Nashville? What you're looking at is a sewage overflow. This one in Brentwood on Hillsborough Road by the Lennox Park subdivision. 
We caught neighbor Philip Martindale working in his yard and showed him the numbers. More than 5 million gallons spilled out in 2019 from multiple Brentwood locations. What did you think about these numbers? That's concerning. I, I've, I, you know, honestly had had no idea. You know, we're we're kind of uh, uphill upstream and and uh, out of sight, out of mind a little bit. So it's very concerning that that type of thing's happening in this neighborhood, especially with uh, some new development coming in in the immediate area. It's the same type of problem Fox 17 News has reported on in Nashville, where the pervasive problem spurred a rate hike to pay for infrastructure improvements and threats of a lawsuit from Tennessee Riverkeeper David Whiteside. We're allowing these developers to dump whatever they want, and they're compromising the river. City of Clarksville also battling the same type of overflows and lawsuits. All of Middle Tennessee is going through this. All of our infrastructure is old. Dory Bowles with the Harpeth Conservancy calls it a matter of priorities. Exactly. Should we be concerned about that? Yes. Why? Well, so first of all, it's illegal. <laughs> so under, under all the state um, sewer permits, it, it's prohibited to have overflows. But the fact is, they do happen. And usually during big rains. Overflow is a combination of rain and sewage. So that means it's never got to a sewer plant. So it's raw sewage, raw human waste. Right where we're walking right, right now. Yep. All in this area, and it'll be popping into the creek right over here. Right there. And yep. then from there, it goes, it goes straight into the little Harpeth. Brentwood showed us compromised pipes like this one and the reinforcement work they've done by state order over the last decade. Brentwood City Manager Kirk Bednar. We'll find um, a contractor has drilled through a sewer line to put in a, a, a storm drain pipe as part of a new development. You don't find that until either something comes up out of the ground or you're videoing. He says plans now are to build a storage tank for big rain events. We'll be able to divert that peak into this tank, store it there, and then as the event ceases and the system kind of goes back to normal, you let that out of the tank and into the system. But Bednar says that's still a couple of years off. And a lot of this is caused by growth and more pressure on the system, correct? Well, to some extent, I mean, you know, um, new growth adds flow to the system. But the reality is we would never have an overflow if it was just based upon base sewer flows from development. It's the rainwater getting in the system that is what's causing the overflow. So, again, we're trying to manage both of those. Brentwood uses this computerized hydraulic model to gauge the impact of any new development and requires developers to pay for any capacity upgrades to the sewer system. There's a meeting coming up January 30th at 9 a.m. in Brentwood. Any new development. So now you know what a sewer overflow looks like when it's big. Um, and it's, um, there'll be these hotspot areas. So um, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna switch back for a second because I thought that really covered it really well. I mean, it really was a nice visual to everything Ron has said. And what I'm gonna focus on now for y'all is how to identify sewer overflows. I think a lot of times we don't realize that they might happen in different places we might have seen something. As Ron said, there's ways that people can help. Um, and um, here's a particular, this is a typical one. Um, I mean, for people who may not realize it, but most sewer lines sort of run down near the creeks because it's water runs downhill. So when there is an overflow and it comes out of a, a manhole, it typically will get into a water body. Uh, this is just one that happened in Franklin. It's nothing atypical, just, but what's interesting is when these things happen, in this case, it was some blockage. Something got down on the system and, and popped the manhole out, the manhole cover off. But down here, do you see this image here? This is a lot of bacteria now growing in the creek, and this is a gray look to it. So the bacteria has bloomed in, uh, by feeding on that, the human waste, the nutrients in the creek. And this was actually identified, oddly enough, this little creek is in an industrial area where it was a plumbing company. And they said, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. So he actually smelled something and knew something wasn't right. So he called the city. But that's kind of what typically can happen. The, the white part is the lime that they'll put, any sewer system will put down and run. There may be others as well. But that's killing the bacteria on the land, but you don't stick that in the water body. So the other thing I'll show you, um, is what it looks like when, let's say you're hiking, or you, uh, as Ron said, you might smell something. This was just nearby recently in a, one of the small small sewer systems that we have in Williamson County. Um, I'll give you, a, it's a video that we have on our website. Oh, here we go. 
So this was um, just from a person, they were hiking, and so they uh, recorded it with their phone, and then they knew that there's a sewer plant nearby because they live in this neighborhood, so then they um, contacted the sewer plant operator, and they were able to fix it um, within a day, but it was on a Sunday, and the sewer plant operator's not out there every day, and they wouldn't have known otherwise. So do you see the toilet paper? And obviously it's coming out of the manhole, but she, she, she actually followed a creek that wasn't going to go. She followed this water back up and down. Mm -hmm. So here's the, this is what she saw. She crossed over there. See that path? Mm -hmm. And it's going into Curry Creek right there. And since she hikes it every day, and it stunk and it, didn't, it wasn't normal. So she walked up into the woods there and found the manhole. So best thing you can do is you see something that's odd like that is get your phone out. Um, and then um, hopefully you have an idea of like what you're near, but you maybe you don't. Uh, but I wanted to give you an idea that sort of a, that can happen just out of the blue. It doesn't have to be a chronic problem. And Sometimes what happens is there'll be a sinkhole that shows up on a sewer line. And I bring this up just because this can happen to any sewer system. And, you know, unfortunately it happened to Franklin, but it's happened in other places. This actually was a relatively new big gravity sewer line that was installed. So this was only 16 years old, supposed to last 50 years. Turned out there probably was an installation error. And when Franklin started really sending those uh, cameras through the system, the lines, they noticed it was cracked all on top. This was only a 16 year old line. This neighborhood, this is their greenway and they know the sewer lines there because they're near the sewer plant, the big front sewer plant. They're like, why is there a big hole that showed up in the middle of our greenway? And then this is what happened. You have to have this huge construction project. And I just wanted to show you, like here is a big park and on the Harpeth River, this is Harlandsdale Park. And the sewer line, the massive big gravity sewer line runs down the river to the south and here's the neighborhood and that's where the sinkhole first started and then eventually a lot of this area was compromised so it was a very big project that um, Franklin had to undertake and um, um, we'd have to double check with them if they've confirmed whether there was an installation um, error that caused the compromising in the line but that can happen. So and wrapping up and sort of focusing on um, the importance of these sewer overflows being more obvious and, and that the public be more familiar. Right now, as, as uh, Ron mentioned, and some of you on the call know this, when you have a sewer overflow, you send a report into the state or you, you compile it and then you send in something once a month. In certain cities of, of Tennessee, there are some other techniques of getting more information from the public more quickly. And when we were working with Franklin in the settlement of our citizen suit, we worked with them on like a standard technique for the size of an overflow and how to report it to the public. Like if it's a small overflow, it didn't, it's not affecting anybody, or if it's one that hits waterways. So this chart here comes out of their report plan. And then it, within two days, it's up on a website. Uh, Brentwood uses a sy system like this now. And uh, we would really like to see that sort of standardized in all kinds, all the sewer permits, because it makes it easier for the public to be more familiar and it also builds in the elected official support um, for keep you know for keeping the um, uh, the funding going towards co you know, maintenance and operations and infrastructure upgrades. And of course, my dogs decide to bark. I don't know if you guys can hear that or not, but let me show you how it works because I think it's important um, that if you are in Franklin and Brentwood, and I'll show you where it is on Nashville's website. There might be a few others, but then I'll show you how you can get on the state to find it, but it's not easy. And I think that's really the most important thing is making this information much easier for the public um, so they can find out if they're hot spots in their area. So I'm back out a second. And so here's Franklin's website. Oh, I'll show you that to wrap up for fun. So here's their website. They have a page and it's linked on, we have a, we have a page on our website that's called Sewer Overflows. This is a whole little blog that we'll be putting up um, like tips for how to report a sewer overflow. So the numbers and so forth. But um, there are links on this page and that's, um, Franklin has one. If you go to Franklin, you say sewer overflows, it pops up. 
and they will put right here the releases or the overflows that are happening. So you see the date, you see the location. In this case, that's the sewer plant, how long, and then you push on that and it'll pop up the report that they write. And that's up there within two days. So you can become more familiar with what um, is going on and for something going on in your neighborhood, if it's a one-time deal, if it's more of a systemic problem. Brentwood has something that's very similar just so you can see it. And actually there's some of their video, but this is, they just put their 2020 list um, on, a, on a PDF you can pull up, otherwise the whole list is there. The hot spots you already showed you on the map. Nashville's got one like this where every month, Ron, let's see, you, the sanitary sewer overflows are first. So if you push on December, all of the ones for December pull up and that whether they're where they are. And then down here is the combined sewer overflow like he talked about, the big pipes that go straight into the Cumberland that mostly have just rain in it. So the hard part, what if you don't have a city that uses this kind of system? Then you need to go to the state's website. And I don't, uh, I just want you to know it's out there. And um, we can, if you feel this is the kind of thing you'd like us to put in a little video so that people can go, I'd like to know how to find, you know, information about my local sewer system, we can do that. But it's, the TDEC has an incredible website where a lot of information is very available, just like once you know how to navigate it. So there's a thing called a water resources permits data viewer. And when you click on it, go away. I'm trying to get my um, zoomy thing to go away so I can pull up the typical, right? It's right in the way. Well, I'll do it anyway, I'll do it this way. So there you go, you get this really cool database. And then you type in your sewer plant name. Now I've done this already. I picked Water Authority of Dixon County just because it's another area of the Harpeth. And then you have to get a little savvy about how to find the, the permit that has to do with the sewer plant. So this is what I'm saying, it's not that easy, but down here where Frank, they actually manage the Fairview sewage treatment plant and they have one on Jones Creek, that's their main one. And then if you push this, it'll pull up the link and look, everything you could ever know about what's been going on for the last 15 or 20 years, TDEC actually puts up here and the reports that come in, emails, everything like that. And actually right over here, here's one right there, Overflow, Farley Court, Hunting Camp Creek. So you can click that button and download the report. So that's why we've, we're interested in trying to adopt what Franklin's been doing sort of as a standardized model for all permitting, all sewer plant reporting um, so the public has more access. So for fun, but also because I think it's very important that we all realize that a lot of us in our own behavior, um, like don't put too much stuff down that, um, don't take all the food waste and grind it down your, what do you call the thing that grinds up the food in your, your sink? Garbage you know. disposal. Thank you, that fancy <laughs> word. Now, I know that most sewer systems do not like people having garbage disposals because they put everything down there. Mm -hmm. um, so they did this wonderful thing called Grease Busters. These guys are hilarious. Uh, Mark and Michelle right there, she's now the head of the sewer department. She was pregnant with twins at the time and she's in this jumpsuit. But this whole page here is very similar to what uh, is on Nashville's website about what not to put down the drain. Grease, eggshells, vegetable peels. Very interesting about rice and, and pasta because it'll become a glue and it doesn't have to, it can glue up your own pipes. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you very, they've got some great ones, but I, the reason why I asked about whether people do fryers is this. Woo, that's one fine looking bird. Let me get rid of this grease. I'm gonna pour it down the drain. Nobody will know. Hey mister, you can't do that. This is a dog fire grease busters. Guys, this looks like a class four operation. Oh man, this is so not good. Only rain down the drain, mister. Polluting our storm drains can lead to pollution in our waterways and cause problems for aquatic life and fish. Thanks, Grease Busters. We'll make sure he never puts anything down the drain again. But if he does... Who are you, you gonna, gonna call? call? Grease Busters! So you gotta give him credit. <laughs> and you know what? They wanted to do this so bad anyway, so when we did the settlement agreement, they're like, great, now we can go into production because it is part of their outreach and education. But it's amazing how many people just aren't aware of 
what their actions do and how it messes up the infrastructure. So I, you know, we're welcome to ask, answer any questions, open up at any time. I'll stop sharing my screen, but um, I really appreciate Ron's time as well because he really has the expertise. And so I was hoping that maybe some of what I could provide is like on the ground, what it looks like since um, I never knew any of this either until I started working on rivers. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask any questions that you have now. Um, Ron, I don't know if you want to expand on um, Kathy's, um, Kathleen, was it Kathleen or Kathy? Kathy Weber's um, um, question that you already answered. I did, but I can answer to everybody. Um, there may be certain lines that we're going to uh, line that have debris in them. And yes, we use essentially a jet cleaner, a hydraulic cleaner with a lot of force they can wash that debris down. The debris then is collected. We typically do then an inspection of that sewer to determine the conditions before we line it, put the liner in, and then reinspect it afterward. Hey, hey Ron, yeah. is, is doing the lining fix like a one-time thing, and if it gets clogged again after that, then you can't really do the liner again because you're just making the pipe smaller and smaller, or could you put several liners in the same pipe if, if it continues to have problems? You did a great job of answering your own question. <laughs> <laughs> so the liner typically has a life of about 50 years. And so oh. typically we don't have problems with liners once they're appropriately installed. It is possible to have a problem with a liner, you know, once installed, that's why we reinspect it. If it's properly installed though, it's pretty rare to have problems. It is problematic though, to keep lining because you do reduce the diameter of that pipe mm -hmm. and then reduce its capacity. Okay. And Ron, it's important, this is Sonia from Metro Water Services. It's also important to note that we don't use the liners to help with clogs. Mm -hmm. The liners are to repair cracks in those seams to prevent the rainwater from entering the pipes. Even with the liner, when people put grease or wipes or anything that that will still cause a clog even in that brand new lined pipe. Exactly. I think I see one or two people on who have been very attentive to the Brentwood issue. Brentwood was a, a very small community, built a teeny little sewer plant many years ago. And so they have a very small old infrastructure they've been upgrading for years. And they're really large, big, almost last must do is this large storage equalization tank. There's just no way around it. Uh, they did a ton of work to remove a fair amount of that flow, which is how they were able to get approval from TDEC to be able to start hooking up some new growth. Uh, Fairview was under a big a moratorium for quite a while because that sewer plant wasn't working until the Water Authority of Dixon County sort of took it over and remanaged it. And, but this is the big issue is some of the small, it's just growth on top of old and small infrastructure. So um, it's, um, and I, I think for some of us, it's like, so what, what all can we do to sort of incentivize sometimes getting that money and getting it invested because it's more it's like anything else with a house it's more fun to build the porch than it is to replace the roof or fix insulation same thing with cities it's more fun to you know build a new stadium i'm just using generics here you know then then build sewer new you know build sewer equalization tanks but nashville is also unusual because it's actually you guys have absorbed like four other small towns too right so you now have like five different systems that you're managing that were built separately originally, something like that. Yeah, there were multiple small systems in Nashville before uh, Metro government consolidated. And we've taken over most of those. There are two exceptions to that. But you know, in general, as you described with many small systems, those collection systems weren't in great shape and we had to make a lot of improvements yeah. to bring them up to our standard. Yeah, exactly. Does anybody have any questions about a particular area or anything else they want to add or like their experiences or suggestions for um... uh, uh, this is Penny Kimley and um, I have a question. Um, my daughter and my niece, they go kayaking on the Harpeth River and probably a month or so ago, um, they came back and really complained that the river reaped. And so we usually drop them off at Pinkerton Park. And we'll pick them up either at Harlandale or Williamson County Rec Center. So between those two points, where would you think would be a uh, possibility? Because I heard you talk about Harlandale Farm having an issue in that area with the sewer. Would, 
Would yeah, one thing that's going on in Franklin is they're doing a massive sewer construction and upgrade. And so depending on where, what phase they're in, they may not be able to contain everything. And depending mm -hmm. on the, and Ron can even address this even more in temperature, sometimes the, the, the odor from just the mm -hmm. normal sewer plant operations can like settle down and settle into the low area. So I don't know, but I just want you to know that right now there's a multi-year um, sewer construction and expansion project going on at Franklin. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I was just wondering about the safety of the water. <laughs> and that would be more of a sampling thing, unless you're seeing like something gray, bacteria. And that's a, anybody else on the line with experience like that? Like what would be a, like a visual if there might be a big problem like that? Maybe potential. That's one reason why I wanted to be on here because after they complained, I said, well, I don't know what to look for. <laughs> you know or what do smell, i do smell is one thing and then calling franklin up in this particular case because anybody need just like ron said the smell and where you smelled it is just that way they can go out and um at least investigate right in yeah. small streams like the couple of the ones i was showing you if the manhole is releasing a lot of times what people are seeing is like a gray sheen or just something looks off the color and if you see those little filamentous things growing, they're just gray, that's bacteria. That's an indication that it could be a, um, doesn't even have to be from a manhole. It could be from a, a septic field that's mm -hmm. not, not working anymore. And so it's just leaching into a, a nearby creek. Those are another signs okay. that somebody's septic tank and field aren't working anymore. Mm -hmm. So we should always call the city whenever we smell anything, like even if it's outside of a restaurant or a business or something like that. Well, that's or... what Ron and I were chatting about. Is I was wanting to have those maps up because, like, if you're in certain areas of Nashville, mm -hmm. it's it's normal. If you're in downtown Franklin, for example, it's not. So there's only three combined sewer overflow systems in Tennessee, right, Ron? Clarksville, Chattanooga. Correct. And then you need to kind of know where the maps, the, the areas are. Maybe that's something that, I mean, can be on our website, but that's, uh, it never hurts to, maybe that's one of the things we do. If you smell something, you know, check, check the site. Maybe we need to have those on our own website so you can see where you were. But I would say that um, that's not going to, across Tennessee, that's not going to be the option. It will be something's up. Like somebody's clean outs uncovered or, you know, something's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So Ron, I see you answered Jane's uh, question about upcoming uh, project areas and, and that information is listed on a website, you say? Yeah. Is this oh, you mean like where you got, where the Met Nash Nashville's doing upgrades? Yes. Yes. And I think other utilities are trying to be more transparent. You know, just like Dory said, you know, Franklin Brent would have, you know, more information on websites. We certainly have more than we used to as well. Mm-hmm. Hello, Ron. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, Chip. Yeah. Hi, Ron. My name's Chip. Uh, I've been watching from a distance as Nashville has gone through some of this work, which is seems to me to be an unbelievably massive and expensive undertaking, and I salute the city for doing it. Uh, and I know it's years in the process. Where are you all at this point? How many years away are you from completing and meeting your goal? Well, that's a darn good question, Chip. Um, for the sanitary sewer overflow initiative. We have a deadline of August, 2028 to complete the work. For the work to correct this combined sewer overflows, the deadline of 11 years started this past December. So we have 11 years to complete work for combined sewer overflows. Yeah, that's a, that's a real wow. And uh, sort of to build on what uh, Dory said, um, politically, that is a massive expense because the taxpayers can't see it. It's invisible and it's underground, but it's hugely important. And what all you are doing, uh, you can't underestimate the public health benefit to that. That is certainly true. You know, when we were negotiating the consent decree, we agreed to a period of 11 years after approval of those two plans. And we assumed, naively as it turned out, that that approval took six years to get approval for the SSO plan. And it took eight years to get approval for the CSO plan. The good news is though, that that gave us a really good head start on getting work done. Wow. 
So one, one last thought, uh, and I'm reading about coronavirus and wastewater. Um, can you enlighten us all in, into what the latest research is showing and how that may or may not affect what Nashville or all of our Tennessee cities have to do relative to coronavirus and our, our sewage discharge? Well, I guess there's a couple of issues there. The first is, is, are there concerns about the safety of utility workers as a result of coronavirus? And in general, the data that we've seen indicate there's not a concern. The second issue is, can you use data for coronavirus testing to indicate an early surge in an area? <clears throat> and although Nashville doesn't have data along that line, other utilities have indicated that you can see, you know, an indication of a surge of cases coming before those cases get diagnosed in a doctor's office. So, you know, that's been kind of an interesting uh, data creation option for certain utilities. Is there a concern about coronavirus getting out, leaking into the environment, or are they finding that once it gets into the environment, it naturally degrades and dies? It naturally degrades and dies, just like you know, most other viruses and bacteria. So what Ron and I've also discussed is the sanitary sewer overflows that will happen like without it being a lot of rain, that's really not diluted. So you're seeing a lot of bacteria that hasn't been treated hit the waterway. When you have something like what Brentwood, what that video show, when you have a lot of dilution with the water and then it's going, it's happening during rain. A lot of this is diluted being washed into bigger bodies of water, but that doesn't, most people aren't out in it at that time either, but nonetheless, it's not an excuse not to deal with it. But the big thing that when you're trying to prioritize, that's one reason why you've sometimes seen them try and fix manholes and areas that break during dry other events. They'll fix those quickly. It's harder when they have a capacity issue because of rain, because it requires more money. But um, you know, everyone, I would say, I would, and Ron mentioned at the beginning, the EPA starting in 1998 started focusing on big cities and make, and really looking at whether they were spending the money to keep their systems, um, their collection systems and their sewer systems sort of, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, they were current, they, they were paying attention and most cities weren't. So it was really valuable. Depending on which city you were, it was almost like the relationship with the EPA gave them the uh, what they needed, the political capital and backing to get the money and get their capital monies being spent. And then, it, then EPA went down to the, the, the smaller cities. So they went and reviewed Franklin's, let's say, in 2010. So it's one of those things where people don't like to save. And then when you have public going, why am I spending that much on sewage when they spend twice, three times as much for all these other services? Um, is that, look, this is one of the fundamental, <laughs> fundamental aspects of a service to the community is to make sure the sewer system works. And so we don't want to get out ahead of it. So it's been very interesting to have the role of government also sort of help elected officials and the public sort of not let things slide. Well, we are at 7.01. So officially we are done. I don't know if Dory or Ron want to stick around for a couple minutes if people still have questions. Um, but Thank you all very much for coming. Angela put a bunch of cool information and kind of um, other follow-up ideas in the chat if you want to take a look at. Certainly follow us on social media and then look for a follow-up email from us with the presentations um, and just kind of direct you guys to other information that you know might find interesting and, and want to follow up with, with our experts here. But thank you all so much for coming. This was really informative and, and I hope you all uh, kind of had a, a, a good Wednesday night with us. And as I said, I mean, I've got a few minutes. I don't know if Ron does. Um, so certainly, but let us know if, you know, if you stay on if you want to. Is there anything related to this topic? I'm amazed at how few people know how to manage a septic field and a septic tank. Uh, that seems to be a big issue across the state. But, you know, like tips. Thanks, everyone. And we I'll also really thing. appreciate your support and just keeping up and being eyes and ears for, you know, Tennessee's waterways. And now you yeah, know what yeah, to do. Yeah, this was really great, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, Kathleen. Thanks for joining us. All right. Hey, Kathy, I see you there. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Paul. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night. All right. Good night, guys.